We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I'd like to now begin the question and answer session. And I have, um, we have a series of questions from our audience and I'm going to start with the first one. So for Gerardo, you mentioned in your talk, the large number of new species described recently, including species of primates and other mammals. Do you think there could be a cost to over splitting taxonomic units inflating new species numbers, which conservationists are fond of doing. In other words, the red wolf comes to mind, which rather than a new species, is a hybrid between coyotes and wolves. That's a good question. Thank you for that. You know, in, in reality, what we're talking about is here is a mixture of things. On the one hand, that's indeed a part of the problem that uh, taxonomists likes in, in many cases to split the species in one species, in several species. But what we're, we're looking here basically is because we have much better data in terms of the uh, genetics and the methods and so on. We really are looking here at a phenomenon that in, involves uh, uh, three things. One is a split in a species, just morphologically or geographically, and that could uh, put the species higher than. Uh, and the second is like, uh, with the new methods, we really are finding out that many species that were cryptic species that look uh, very similar are indeed uh, genetically completely different. And third, many of the new species are completely dif different taxa that are being found in places that were too remote to be uh, uh, accessed. But let's, rem let's remember one thing, and that we have described no more than 2 million species of all the plants and animals and microorganisms that are on the planet. And that the uh, lowest estimates indicate that there may be between 50, 15 to 50 million of a species. It is clearly a, a pattern that most of the species that live in this planet are undescribed, scientifically speaking. Thank you. Question is to David Hallway. In cases where invasive species have become disruptive to an ecological community, how do scientists weigh the pros and cons of introducing another non-native species that may help to contain the other non-native population that is proliferated or controlled? In other words, is it possible to act on an invasive species by introducing another invasive species in a controlled environment without disturbing the rest of the ecosystem? That's an excellent question. And it is the province of, of biological control. So uh, it's possible to introduce uh, animals to control problematic plants, and animals to control problematic animals. There are other examples of biological control as well. Historically, uh, the field of biological control was uh, less critical than it is today concerning unintended consequences of introductions. And that was uh, in part due to some early successes in the field of biological control. Biological control is a very important field and modern practitioners of that field are uh, very careful uh, to assess uh, the potential risks of uh, introduction. And that can include um, host shift, 
changes, for instance, where a biological control agent will start uh, consuming uh, a species other than that for which the control was originally intended. Um, it can also include uh, food web disruptions, so changes in the relative abundance of different species. And those changes can be very hard to predict. So I guess I could summarize by saying that any, any biological control introduction has to be very carefully researched, and that's the mindset of that field uh, currently. Thank you. I'll take over again. Um, this is a question for Ollie Ryder. As mentioned by Gerardo, massive popula population annihilation is an even larger threat than species loss. How do you propose prioritizing population over species conservation? Well, that's a good and challenging question. I think you would look at it within the context of the information we have about uh, from census populations, but that's a very small number of species actually. Um, and I think it's possible to use this, these estimates of, of genome sequencing to add to this uh, by um, quickly obtaining data that would point to whether a species was had very low variation or what its genetic load might be. And that's something that could be utilized uh, for uh, making assessments like this. There's now a, an Earth Biogenome Project that aims to sequence um, all of the known species on Earth in 20 years, uh, which is extremely ambitious, but um, uh, a lot of work is being done on that. And that's gonna give us a completely new view of, uh, the, uh, of the relative um, threats to species, at least from their own uh, kind of internal um, genetic uh, vulnerabilities. Tying that with what Gerardo was saying in terms of low, in terms of population diversity, you mentioned this too in your talk, in terms of genome diversity. Thank you. Okay, I have a question for Jessica Thompson. Given that fire and its transformative and destructive policy is especially relevant to the California landscape, can you describe the historic use of fire to transform the landscape here? Are there ways to learn from the legacy and reverse the process again in this specific landscape to turn damages into managers? So the, the question is about um, the California landscape in particular, which is of course very much in the media these days. And it's not just California, it's the entire West Coast. And we know that this is also happening on a number of other continents. It's just what we tend to see here in the United States most prominently. And we also know that there are, um, basically humans have been in North America since the beginning of the Holocene, which means that all of the vegetation transformation that took place and the accompanying changes in the ecosystem with respect to large mammal communities, small mammals, birds, everything, the changes with vegetation, um, those would have happened at the shift from the Pleistocene into the Holocene while people were actually present. And most likely while people also had access to this particular form of landscape management. So when we look at the sort of what we might call a natural ecosystem in this area, and I think this is true for everywhere really in, in the world, we, we actually don't really know what that landscape would have looked like without people in it. Because we go back far enough to the point in time when there were no people in it, we're back in the ice ages, which would have been a totally different set of, of um, ecosystems in that area. So with respect to the issue of fire, I know that there have been some historical documents and a little bit of kind of data, informal data from early trappers and people who were kind of moving throughout that area while indigenous people were still living there in large communities and engaging in their indigenous land management practices. But they're very spotty sorts of records. Um, you know, by the time people were going there, conducting ethnography and systematically documenting these practices, they were mostly gone and, and far out of the context where they originally would have been done. So historic data don't actually help us as much as we would hope. I think really the lesson is that we have to go beyond um, written history and we need to gain as much as we can from the, um, you know, from the paleoenvironmental and archaeological records of, of those kinds of ecosystems. So with respect to this particular landscape, I, um, 
wouldn't want to comment or provide recommendations, but I think what we're dealing with is something that's a lot more complicated than then try, just trying to revert back to a couple of hundred years ago, which was already a pretty artificial ecosystem. And they no longer have information from the past that they need. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now for Asher Rossinger, uh, is there a possibility that places will actually run out of water? Or is it more that places in the future will not have access to fresh, clean, drinkable water? Thanks. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that we've seen a few examples of uh, cities like Cape Town in South Africa that experienced day zero, which was the, um, the point at which there was more freshwater extraction than there was groundwater and freshwater available. Mexico City has also actually um, been past uh, day zero, as you know, how we call it, in which they've been transporting fresh water into the city to meet their water needs. And so while they're, while humans are using more and more fresh water and we're, we're losing uh, water, fresh water from uh, glaciers melting, over abstraction of aquifers, groundwater, um, including the salinization of freshwater lakes that we're seeing. For example, the, the Great, La Great Lakes um, are also experiencing some salinization um, with you know, what many of the other uh, panelists have spoke about today, including population growth. You know, will we reach a point at which we don't have enough uh, fresh water to meet human needs? Well, it's, it's possible. Um, but there are also uh, technological advancements like desalination of water that can potentially meet human water needs. The trouble there is what do you do with all the, all the uh, saline brine that occurs when you, when you uh, remove the salt from the water? So um, I think that there needs to be a lot of um, careful thinking about how we use water and how we reuse water. Um, Wastewater treatment and recycling of water is something that a lot of different countries have been working on in terms of both for, you know, we don't think about it in terms of something that would be quite potable or uh, enjoyable to drink, um, drinking wastewater, but it, it can be treated to the point where it is potable and drinkable. Um, uh, nobody kind of wants to think that they're drinking water that has gone through the toilet and then, you know, through our excreta, but um, if you've watched Dune, the book, you know, they all have their still suits in which they're, you know, uh, recycling their own body water. Potentially, you know, we can have large scale systems to recycle that uh, fresh water. Okay, a question for Rob Knight. Can humans survive without a gut microbiome? Well, of course, we know the mice that we have that have no gut microbiome. If not, do we know what is the minimal necessary gut microbiome to survive? Or do we help their sports as a human? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the short answer is no, we don't know the minimum gut microbiome to survive in humans. Um, the uh, individuals who've been raised essentially in a bubble with uh, skid and similar conditions have uh, not, to my knowledge, been assessed for uh, microbiome, although that would be fascinating to do. Um, we do know that people can survive after uh, extremely severe knockdown of the microbiome by antibiotics, which can uh, which can reduce it by uh, reduce the microbiome by many orders of magnitude in terms of cell count, but uh, there's still a fair diversity of microbes that survive any particular antibiotic regimen, and it's also very difficult to assess them when they're at very low cell counts. So I think it's a very interesting question, but the data are basically not available at this time. But we do have mice that are germ-free, right? They survive. Yeah. Yeah, correct. So for other animals, uh, mice can survive without any microbiome as all, uh, at all. Uh, they, are, um, they are less fecund, so uh, they live longer lives, but uh, their reproductive rate is lower. And so there's definitely an evolutionary advantage to having a microbiome in mice. Um, hamsters and rats and pigs can all be raised germ-free to adulthood. Although, uh, again, um, with substantially harm to reproduction, although, again, I believe the individual lifespans are longer. Uh, other species that have been tried, like lambs, for example, uh, can, uh, and calves, 
I believe are only able to be maintained for a couple of weeks. So uh, they require microbes uh, more essentially and at a much earlier stage in their development to be able to survive at all. David Tillman, what fraction of the global food supply could be produced without artificially bound nitrogen? Would this fraction of food supply be enough to feed our global population or would other novel practices, technologies be required to sustainably feed humanity? Well, having no nitrogen fertilizer in the short term uh, would lead to a massive food shortage. And whenever there are food shortages, the people who get the food are the rich people. So it would be uh, a, an incredibly um, uh, harmful to the poorer people of the world who could not afford the prices food would go to. The, about um, 30 to 40% of the total food produced on earth right now could be produced without any uh, artificial fertilizer. But there are other ways besides fertilizers to make soils more fertile. Uh, cover crops can be grown on them, rotation of crops uh, that, uh, that add nutrients back into the soil. Some work in prairie ecosystems that a student of mine has done shows that different kinds of plants actually put different nutrients back into the soil. Some plants put a lot of potassium, some other plants put in more nitrogen, some put in more phosphorus, some put in more calcium. Uh, and so a diversity of plants uh, or a diversity through, rot through rotation can actually lead the soil to become more fertile. Uh, so the, I don't think that no fertilizer is the solution. I think that using fertilizers much more efficiently, much more wisely is what we need to do. And to transition toward an agriculture where we have better retention of nutrients through cover crops uh, grown between the time when a crop isn't growing uh, and probably going toward a, a more diverse mixture of crops. Intercropping, we have two or more species together, for instance, does increase soil fertility. So I think those are the, those are the more workable solutions. I'm unwilling to let the, have the poor of the world starve uh, because we quit using fertilizer. I agree with you. So could you give us a quick um, estimate of how you might be able to increase efficiency of fertilizers? As oh, it's, opposed to, yes, please. It's, it's actually quite easy. Um, there's been so much work done on major crops that we know how much nitrogen a corn plant needs to have provided to it sort of every day of its life. And the same thing is true for wheat and rice and so on. And uh, there are detailed models, empirically based agricultural models, which let farmers know how much fertilizer they really need to add at any given moment in time. Uh, China had the a 20 million farmer experiment that was done where 20 million farmers followed the advice of, of, this, of these models for their particular crops. And they had yields that went up a bit, but, the, uh, but their nitrogen use went down about 30%. Yeah. So uh, it's, it, there's really a very easy, about a 30% reduction we can achieve right now with a little bit of knowledge passed on to farmers. And farmers have to believe the knowledge That's the other dilemma. They are uh, inherently rather conservative because they can't afford uh, not to have the yield they need. Especially the ones in certain areas. Right. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay, another question about food to Walter Willett. Your models point out that you need at least to halve our food waste in order to hit various important goals by 2050. Can you explain on some, expand on some of the strategies you think would be most successful? One question is at what stage of the food production and consumption cycle do you see most promise for reducing waste? Yes, thank you for the uh, question, which is a complicated, uh, but an important yes. and, and good question. Uh, that on a global basis, uh, I think my understanding is about half of the food loss and waste uh, is and often in this area, this is a distinction is made loss being what happens uh, in the, on the farm on the production side of it and waste uh, after it, <clears throat> it's left to farm, which can be at uh, food services, but also in homes. Uh, but uh, this half and half varies a lot depending where we are, that in low income countries, uh, that uh, the losses at the farm are often much greater because there are not transportation and preservation facilities like refrigeration that can move food when it's uh, uh, ripe or ready to be harvested to uh, into the consumer uh, part of the food chain. Uh, but in uh, our uh, more higher income countries, much of the loss and waste is waste uh, that occurs 
uh, in food services and, and a substantial fraction in, at homes. Uh, it actually, uh, a lot of this waste is intentional that uh, the health community has told people, for example, that we should cut all the fat off of our meat and uh, throw it away because it's not good for us, uh, that we should definitely not uh, reuse cooking fat uh, and we should throw that away. Uh, uh, and um, that a lot of resources, uh, fertilizer, energy, uh, uh, and other resources went into producing that fat that we're purposely uh, throwing away. It, it, it's actually quite, can be quite substantial. Uh, and that's relatively recent phenomena. Even when I was growing up in, in the Midwest and we were cooking red meat, uh, the, uh, the fat was made into gravy. We put that on our potatoes. That wasn't very good for us, but, um, uh, it, but it's in, in just a relatively recent history. We've consciously been throwing away a lot of food to, in, uh, into which we put a lot of resources to develop. So there's uh, a lot of deep thinking that needs to go into this all the way from, again, uh, the very early stages of production all the way to consumers right in the hole. Isn't it true that a lot of food is thrown away because it doesn't look attractive enough? It's got blemishes and so it doesn't even end up on the supermarket shelves? Right, yes, that's a, certainly another reason for waste is just, uh, we're, we're, we're very, uh, you might say wasteful. And, and that's just because something doesn't look good, we uh, often just leave it in the field. Uh, it, we really can't afford to be doing this. Well, for Patricia Hunt, if EDCs can affect the endocrine system as a whole, which is able to control many aspects of health, including sleep and metabolism, is there a difference in the levels of aberration in the eggs and adults versus in the fetus, which doesn't necessarily act the same as adults, and i.e., for example, sleep and behavior. In other words, does BPA affect many things within the endocrine system that accumulate to impact fertility to a higher extent in adults compared to fetuses? Or is there a bias for BPA acting on genes related to the generation of eggs and sperm? It's a long question. Good question, but it's yeah. a question. Let's see if I can answer it. Um, so I may have misled you to think that it's all happening through the eggs and sperm. Um, all of these effects that are seen in subsequent unexposed generations have to be passed through our germline. So they have to be going through eggs and sperm. But really for these chemicals, what's critical is the developing embryo is much more sensitive. So these chemicals can impact the development of a lot of different organ systems. The developing brain is most notable, um, but things as seemingly simple as developing mammary gland and de developing prostate gland, these chemicals can alter, slightly alter the development of those, those tissues in a way that may not look very serious, but can increase the risk of cancerous transformations in the adult. Um, so the, the things we worry about the most are developmental exposures um, because we're hitting an individual and causing permanent changes. In the adult, some of those changes may be transient. For instance, we could expose an adult woman who's making an egg and she could ovulate a bad egg, a chromosomally abnormal egg. And if that exposure ceases, in subsequent cycles, she may ovulate perfectly normal eggs. Um, so we tend to think of development as the most sensitive time point, but it's true that these chemicals affect us at all different stages and in different ways, including things like chemotherapy. If you're taking chemotherapy and we want those drugs to act, if we have these endocrine disrupting chemicals interfering with the actions of that, that chemotherapy, it can, alter the course of that disease. So it's actually really, really complicated because I always tell my, my students, it depends on when we look and where we look. Yeah. These effects. Fascinating, really fascinating. Question to Alice Gorman. In your talk, you mentioned that there's a view that currently there's no moral obligation to protect the space environment. What do you think it would take for people and institution to feel morally obligated to do something about this? A really interesting question. I, I think the first 
solution to this is to have a, a more nuanced and deeper uh, definition of what environment means, one that incorporates all of the complexities of um, interplanetary space and space weather. Uh, like there's, there is this long history of seeing space as a vacuum, which, which of course is, is completely not the case. So we, we need first to, to better develop definitions of what constitutes the space environment and then to understand what kinds of um, intrinsic and extrinsic values that it has. Uh, some of this has to be independent of its uh, utility to humans. Uh, so, so that's like developing a whole new language um, of, of what's out there. So, so and then, then you have to get some kind of um, interest and commitment from people um, to take this into account. So this relates to current debates about sustainable use of space, which are um, you know, everywhere across the, the space world, people at the moment are talking about um, sustainability. And usually this is defined as um, uh, continuing human use of space. Uh, so ethical debates tend to be about um, uh, obligations to humans rather than to the space environment. So, I mean, this is, is kind of fraught territory to enter into because in one level, we can only ever uh, make uh, human assessments of what these environmental values might be. But we managed to do this, you know, on Earth in ways that adequately, I guess, uh, ensure that we haven't completely transformed the entirety of the Earth's surface uh, and you, you could consider we have an opportunity in space to not be as as globally destructive or damaging um, so part of the answer to this is also um, expanding what sustainability means in the space community to encompass um, uh, allowing uh, particular planetary environments to continue in, into time scales that are, are beyond um, you know, human uses of space over the next uh, 50 to 100 years, I guess. Um, another aspect of this is um, interest in buying, buying from the general population who in my uh, experience often have uh, far more uh, sophisticated uh, ideas about what the space environment is and what we might, how we might need to behave in regard to it uh, than do people who are currently uh, driving the agenda for space activities. So uh, hopefully that catches something to, 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 uh, to what that questioner was um, hoping to find. Thanks. What about space tourism? Ah, that's, um, that's an interesting one. Um, so we've got, we've got a lot of people uh, who are suborbital space tourists at the moment, uh, able to take these very short journeys um, onto the edge of space, thanks to the spacecraft being developed by people like uh, Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson. So part of the idea around this is that the view of Earth from outside, from that height, gives you a perspective in which people realise that the Earth is, is united and fragile and therefore requires a greater level of environmental care than it's previously had. This might also develop a sensibility towards the space environment. Uh, well, very sadly, the evidence we have suggests that people who come back from these experiences don't immediately give up their jobs and devote themselves to uh, environmental activism on Earth. So it, it seems a little unlikely that we can expect this to be a transformative experience, which will make people take space environments more seriously as well. Um, I think the difficulties of space tourism suggests that it's not going to make major impacts uh, on the space environment in the short term, short to medium term, and that those impacts are more likely to come from uh, lunar mining, for example, or attempts at um, setting up human habitats on Mars or something like that. So uh, I don't think, I think neither the opportunities nor the constraints around space tourism uh, of, uh, of such an intensity at the moment that we probably really need to take them into account at all. All right, I have a question that is open to all, but I'm going to lob it directly to Gerardo and to Ollie, and then let anyone else come in who wants to. 
because uh, I can think of ways that each of you from your own area of expertise could answer this. So here we are. Mass extinctions and the loss of biodiversity represents a significant existential challenge to planet Earth. Faced with this crisis, is it possible that human, ma human management of endangered species, zoo and agricultural manipulation of natural selection, and even lab design genetic engineering, genetically modified organism, approaches can be employed to slow down the rate of decreasing diversity and counter the seemingly inexorable trends in species extinction? Thank you very much. That's an interesting question. The first thing to say is like uh, the cheapest, uh, most uh, uh, reliable way to save a species is to save in ecosystems. So basically, uh, uh, we need to do a couple of things. And uh, first of all, is to try to conserve as much as many uh, uh, for tropical forests, uh, uh, mangroves, uh, uh, reef, uh, and, and so on. And uh, that's really the cheapest way to try to save most of the biodiversity on the planet. And then uh, make a, a great effort to try to make a human dominated landscape more uh, uh, friendly to support more species. And just give you a, a very quick uh, example. For instance, the palm, palm oil uh, uh, plantations in Costa Rica, there have been some studies where if you leave uh, the understory and you combine the palm, uh, uh, plant, the palm oil plantations with a, a, a local uh, forest, you will have a much uh, a larger portion of the biodiversity surviving in those landscapes. And, and then uh, having everything else, uh, as you say, like uh, all these uh, new uh, technologies that can help to save some of the most endangered species and so on are perfectly uh, uh, important to use. But I will be very, very, uh, uh, um, uh, I will be very, very strong on saying that unless we maintain the ecosystems, the, uh, uh, the, the whatever is left in, in terms of the uh, natural ecosystems, uh, there will be no way we can survive as uh, uh, we can avoid a collapse of civilization by using any other any of the other techniques, uh, there is no way we can uh, really try to preserve and uh, maintain uh, using these uh, techniques, uh, genetic uh, and and so on techniques, uh, the two million species that we need uh, the, the the planet to maintain its stability and to have uh, the conditions that are uh, make possible life on the planet in general and life in the planet for humanity. This is. I will fin finish with this. It is incredibly important to understand that the only way that uh, me and my colleagues, uh, based on the strongest data available, shows that we will survive is maintaining all the, uh, what we can maintain of the natural ecosystems. There is no other way. Thank you. So we have ecosystem management. Could I ask Ali to comment on the zoo end? Do you want to chime in on this? First of all, uh, I want to agree entirely with, with Gerardo. Um, the way to save biodiversity, the most efficient way is to save functional ecosystems. The fact though, that we are in this extinction crisis suggests that we're not going to do that perfectly. And, uh, and from my perspective, uh, I'm thinking that, you know, next year, there's going to be less biodiversity than this year. But we have, for the first time in the history of life on Earth, the opportunity to save living material from individuals after they die or species uh, from species as their numbers are declining. So a sampling of the gene pool of a species now, even if it doesn't go extinct in uh, 20 years, will likely be richer than the gene pool of the species 20 years later. So exploring the options for intervening this way may provide more opportunities uh, in the future, um, simply because the inertia of our loss of species is um, so compelling to consider. And, you know, having, uh, 
uh, said that, you know, it's going to require uh, increases in technological understanding and ability to to bank living cells and a much larger global effort to do that. And just to finish, to wind up, it is not as good a solution as saving everything that we would by functional ecosystems. But um, I don't, I'm not encouraged by the, uh, the trend in doing that. Yeah. If I could jump in, um, Dave Tillman. Um, the, the single greatest cause of extinction risk on earth is agriculture. And uh, increasing risks are being caused by uh, agricultural land clearing uh, around the world. And the pressure for land clearing is driven to a great extent, not so much by population, population matters, but actually increasing income is changing diets. And we're adopting these much less healthy diets with too much meat in them, too many calories and so on. Uh, and if we want to save enough of the natural ecosystems of earth to preserve much, but clearly, but no means all of our biological diversity and keep the earth functioning. We really have to look at what we eat and how we produce food. Uh, if we dedicate land to agriculture, we really should try to get the maximum sustainable yield off it that we can have. And right now uh, in the United States, we consume about 20,000 kcals per day of food not directly, because we would be blimps if we did that. We only need 2,000. But because of all the uh, animals we eat, the biofuels we make, and so on. And so we really have to, if we want to save diversity, and also the same agriculture on its own is going to drive the world past 2 degrees C warming before the end of the century. Even if we quit using fossil fuels immediately, we had a paper on science on this about a year and a half ago. If there's no more fossil fuel combustion as of a year ago, we still are going to go past 2 degrees C, go beyond the, the Paris uh, desired limit because of agriculture, greenhouse gases from nitrogen, greenhouse gases from land clearing, greenhouse gases uh, from ruminants. So we really have to look at what we're eating and what's healthy for us turns out to be a lot healthier for the world. And Walter Will, as you know, knows a lot about that. Thank you. Yeah, so there's, there's a question buried in the, in the long question that came out here, probably for Rob Knight. What about the extinction rate of gut microbiota that are unique to many animal species? Are we losing unique gut micro microbes at the same time we're losing the animals that carry them? Yeah, that's a great question where again, unfortunately there's almost no data and almost no research. Uh, we do know that a lot of species that are found in the gut of, uh, of one mammal or amphibian or other vertebrate are shared among other species, but at the same time, uh, there are definitely levels of endemism where you'll have a microbe that's only associated with, with, one, with one host species, not found anywhere else. And uh, obviously, if you lose that host species, you're going to lose the microbe along with it, unfortunately. Um, one, one major limitation of most of the work that's been done on, on endangered animal microbiomes, including ours, is that a lot of it has been done on zoo animals, and uh, zoo animals do have markedly different uh, microbiomes from animals found in, in the wild due to a combination of differences in diet and differences with the ability to interact uh, with different kinds of microbiomes in their natural environment, including through, uh, through uh, directly ingesting them with their diet and drinking water, uh, as well as exposure to soils and so forth. So, uh, so, so the short answer is that we don't know, but it's a very interesting area of study and uh, definitely the sort of thing that needs more resources devoted to it. The, the microbiota bolt that I mentioned that, uh, that Gloria Jack and I started uh, a few years ago is, um, is, is directly uh, aimed at addressing that type of issue as well as the microbes that are disappearing in human populations around the world right now. But uh, it's still early days, unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, I now have a question for David Holloway. And that is when distinguishing between native versus introduced invasive species, does a reintroduced species count as native? For example, wolves in the Rocky Mountain Northwest, which were wiped out by hunters and trappers are being reintroduced. But some people claim they are not native and do not belong. Yeah, sure, those kinds of distinctions are, are important uh, to think about. And uh, I would say if a, if a species was recently driven extinct, uh, say in the last several centuries, um, it could be considered native, but it's, it's a bit subjective. Uh, another issue that's going to certainly come into play 
uh, in, the, in the future is uh, introducing species uh, into new environments simply to preserve them um, as climates change and, and landscapes change. And conservationists are gonna have uh, challenges in uh, deciding how to uh, introduce species beyond their, their current native ranges simply to save those species uh, in the future. So I just had a general question uh, to David Tillman, I guess, in terms of the introduction of uh, nitrogen into capturing nitrogen, the harbor process also generated chemical warfare, right? The, 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 you know, the process of making nitrogen was probably first mainly used to make uh, munitions for war. Right. And uh, it is interesting is at the closure of World War II, where the world by that time had a massive capability of making uh, uh, Haber-Bosch nitrogen, uh, taking N2 and making it into a usable uh, active form of nitrogen, was when nitrogen and fertilization of crops took off. And so it was sort of turning the swords into plowshares, uh, to, uh, if you will, uh, uh, in some sense what happened. And it had many benefits. And it, I, I think it's easy to look back and wonder why people didn't understand the harm that was gonna be caused. Uh, but I think that's the problem we have as humans. We, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about the future. Uh, and we always imagine the future will be like the past. And I think that's one of the problems we have when it comes to the environment. We aren't asking what kind of world are we creating? What will the world be like in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, if we keep doing what we're doing? And how can we avoid the things that, that are coming along that we don't like? And I think nitrogen fertilizer was one of those. Uh, it was, it's been incredibly important, but it has been overused and misused. Um, but it still is a very important thing for humans to have a food supply. Okay, another question for Asher Rossinger. How does increased sweating in humans compared to great apes fit into the biological, biological adaptations for water scarcity? Sweating seems rather counterintuitive as it leads to body loss. Uh, could you give us other examples of biological adaptations to water scarcity? Sure. So um, it, it's an interesting question, you know, what biological adaptations do humans have to water scarcity? As counterintuitive as it is, humans, non-human primates, um, we actually use less water than um, our great ape relatives. So humans have actually adapted to conserve body water. So we relatively use less water, despite our greater ability to sweat. So we have more eccrine sweat glands, which allows us to dissipate body heat. Part of that is um, a thermoregulatory adaptation to hot environments um, and a decoupling of our thirst from our hydration status. So we can go and exercise and then come back and rehydrate. But some of the other, um, so that's like a behavioral adaptation, you know, this voluntary dehydration, um, uh, you know, behavioral strategy. But some of the other uh, biological adaptations to water scarcity are things like the external nose. So um, our ability to retrieve um, moisture from dry air allows us to, you know, as we're breathing, retrieve it. And so we're actually conserving body water. Um, so yeah, those are, um, and then we have a more linear um, body form. So we can uh, conserve body water relative to, you know, um, Australopithecus, um, like Lucy, uh, are, uh, so Homo sapiens have several biological adaptations to water scarcity, which, you know, water is one of the limiting factors of, um, of evolution of survival. So another question to, for Jessica Thompson. Uh, we all recognize the Amazon has been greatly altered by humans. Is there a point when rainfall becomes so intense that controlling landscape with fire no longer works? At least in the same way as you described for the patchwork and Serengeti. So can you detect changes in habitat caused by fire in places like New Guinea? Essentially, it, are there some places where people just can't use fire in this way? And um, because, because they, of increased rain. Yeah, the, the example of New Guinea is kind of interesting because there is actually um, a pretty good record of ancient fire use up in the montane highlands of New Guinea. And that was one of the first places where that kind of potentially anthropogenic process was identified. And the way it was done was the same thing with this climate anomaly approach where 
you basically see something different in paleo environmental records that seem to suggest a change in fire activity. And then you go and have a look at the archaeological record to see if there's any kind of corresponding change in what it is that humans seem to be doing. And some of the things that they noticed um, were that for sure when you get to the point where there's agriculture, there's, there's definitely a corresponding increase in fire activity. So in that particular area, it's very clear that humans have been um, affecting that environment for a long time. And it's um, also kind of the case that when you think about fire regimes, there are certain ecosystems, of course, that are more flammable than others, but seasonality has a huge effect on the timing of wildfires, natural wildfires. So what humans can do is they can intervene in that ecosystem and ignite fires during times when you wouldn't have a lot of natural lightning strikes. So it sort of changes the fire cycle in the sense that you no longer have a natural fire, wildfire regime that is entirely dependent on the incidence of storms and then the flammability of the vegetation in that particular moment. So you kind of release that constraint and that means that you could get more charcoal input as a result of there being more fire sort of out of season. And one of the biggest problems that we're trying to um, work out is that charcoal itself is a pretty poor indicator of actually being able to directly translate to fire quantity in terms of fire frequency or fire magnitude. So you might see a huge dump of, of charcoal into a river basin, ends up in the lake, and you know that in a relative sense, there's been more fire on that landscape at that time, but you don't know how much more fire. You don't know if it's just a small amount of, um, you know, small numbers of big fires or large numbers of small fires or what you can't really actually discern that. So there are people who are trying to get at this in other ways using biomarkers that are specific to combustion that will also make their way into lake cores and be informative because you can look at them alongside pollen. So I guess that's the long answer to um, there are definitely seem to be places where in spite of there being a lot of rainfall, you still have abundant evidence for humans being able to modify those landscapes and fire being a big part of it, but it's not necessarily going to be the same in every place. There's obviously going to be some ecosystems that are more susceptible than others. Thank you, Jess. Um, a question for Walter Willett. A big issue right now is that a healthy, sustainable diet is expensive, while unhealthy, unsustainable food is cheap. It's also the sense of the grocery stores being set up so that you go to the cheap stuff first. Um, is there a way to price in these externalities, such as nutrition and environmental sustainability, across food groups so that people are incentivized to adopt the reference diet? Do you have ideas about how the economics of food systems need to be adjusted to get people on board with your recommendations? Thanks. Uh, yes, a very important question and part of the bigger, broader question about how we move populations toward diets that are healthy and sustainable. Uh, I would take a little bit issue with the question or with the assumption in the question though, that healthy, sustainable diets are not necessarily more expensive. Uh, that uh, the, the, in general, the more expensive uh, foods are animal sourced foods like, like red meat, and so those are neither healthy uh, nor sustainable. Uh, but uh, uh, a healthy diet can, the healthy diet that we described is actually not the diet of rich people. It actually fits uh, very closely the traditional diet of the Mediterranean, which was really uh, poor farmers that consumed this diet, which was very healthy uh, and sustainable, but not so expensive. Uh, so, uh, we, we don't have to, uh, and uh, some of the cheapest forms of foods are starch and sugar, which are actually uh, unhealthy, but uh, also cheap. So uh, in, in some ways that, that does fit with the description. Basically incorporating the external externalities of environmental damage and healthcare costs would be one way to uh, move people toward a healthier diet that, uh, uh, that has been done with sugar sweetened beverages, which are sort of the extreme of unhealthiness. And uh, we do see that putting a tax on sugar sweetened beverages does decrease consumption. That was first demonstrated in Mexico, now Berkeley, uh, Philadelphia, 
other places. So uh, in court, that was mainly justified by health, uh, health costs. Uh, so these are levers that can work, but there's huge political pushback. Of course, uh, the beef industry does not want us to incorporate the externalities into the cost of a hamburger. So there's very uh, powerful uh, political pushbacks in doing what would uh, be very rational. Yeah. I would also think one of the ways the question was framed could include things like very cheap hamburgers, because those right. are both unhealthy and cheap, and it is meat. Right. right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I didn't write the question, but. <laughs> right. Yes. I, yeah, th these are complicated. There's. Um, it, it basically, uh, we can have a health. We can have a diet that is both healthy and sustainable, and be modest in cost. Not the very cheapest cost, which would be starch and sugar, but uh, a plant-based diet that doesn't use a lot of expensive imported fruit, for example, uh, can be relatively expensive. Inexpensive carrots, cabbage, squash, uh, uh, sweet potatoes. Those are. And a lot of green leafy vegetables are relatively inexpensive, but should be really a primary component of healthy and sustainable diets. Thank you. Thank you. So a question for Patricia Hudd. Does BPA impact fertility to a similar, similar extent around the world? Those are the variations in BP levels around the world in terms of this impact. I don't think we have any way of actually really knowing that. Um, I've been asked a lot of times, what about unexposed populations? And quite simply, there are no unexposed populations. You can go to the most pristine and pick up a handful of sand and what you have is a handful of sand and plastic. Um, so I don't think there's anything, such thing as an unexposed population. There are different subsets of the population that are more exposed. And sadly, this does follow socioeconomic status so that poor people tend to be more exposed because of the lifestyle choices that they have to make. Um, purchasing a lot of canned foods rather than fresh foods, organic produce is out of reach for a lot of people. And since these chemicals are coming from pesticides and plasticizers, you know, consumer choice makes a huge impact on your exposure level. So I don't think we can really say that some populations are more affected around the world, but we can certainly say that within our own country, there are subsets of our population that are, that are much more highly exposed. Alice Gorman, looking to earth, it seems that the moral obligation still isn't enough to drive the necessary measures we need to tackle our own climate change process crises. That is, even though many see it as a major issue, institutions do not act appropriately to handle it. Do you think this speaks to our future of handling space debris? Yeah, I guess it does. Like we don't, we, we haven't managed these things particularly well on earth and we're looking to some of the same institutions to manage them in space. There is a very strong utop utopian strain of thinking in the space community that is hopeful that we will do things better. But if you sort of look closely at the steps being taken to uh, try and bring that about, well, um, it would be hard to point to anything uh, very specific, I guess. Um, and we're also now, um, I mean, I guess there, there is there. You have that strong utopian strain, but you also you couple that with the idea that that space is um, uh, empty. Um, uh, its only purpose is to provide some sort of resource for humans, and we should be out there utilizing those resources. Um, and then uh, the one doesn't counter the other, and we're also um, uh, it, if you're talking to the people who are involved in um, bringing about space mining, for example, um, they are not very keen on the kind of level of regulation that we're accustomed to on Earth now for, for mining activities. So, so they think that it should be unregulated and that it's an imposition um, to expect regulation and that the um, outer space treaties um, don't support that. While for space junk, you know, there is a very general recognition that this is something that could get in the way of commercial 
uh, profit making from telecommunications um, navigation um, and and of course the all important defense uses of space um, I mean many people describe it as a classic tragedy of the common situation where where everybody wants to get their piece of the pie but nobody's willing to take responsibility for ensuring the um, the longevity of these resources and and the concept of the tragedy of the commons has been heavily critiqued from a whole range of different perspectives um, but it you know it does seem to be generally true that uh, short-term perspectives um, are taking precedence over long-term ones and the amount of inaction on cleaning up space debris because it's not it's not easy to make a business case uh, for setting up a mission specifically aimed at actively removing debris you know this is this is a a major impediment to anything being done and we're looking at the very same institutions who put the stuff there to take responsibility for removing it so there's not a good track record there uh, the positive about this is that um, i think there's a growing public awareness that this is an issue and a much lower tolerance for accepting it so i think the hope in this um, situation actually comes from you know, regular voters saying this isn't good enough and we require our governments and our space agencies and our international uh, organisations and NGOs to be more proactive about this. So I think there is hope on that front. But that might help you inform people they're going to lose GPS. Uh -huh. Yes, indeed. That In affects fact, everybody. It does affect everybody. Um, a lot of these systems, interestingly, do not have to be space-based. I see. Uh, but um, so there's a lot of systems for local uh, navigation and coordinates, and a lot of these are being developed by defence because if if uh, defence navigation satellites are taken out, they still want to prosecute conflicts on Earth. So there are many solutions to things we currently rely on space for, but we're not necessarily investing in the infrastructure. So if there was a massive solar flare. Uh, tomorrow that took out most of our Earth orbiting satellites, providing navigation, telecommunications, Earth observation, weather prediction, etc. Um, the terrestrial uh, replacements that can fulfill those tasks are not necessarily having the same level of investment. So by making a choice to move these into space, uh, we are in fact reducing our resilience against things like massive solar flares or uh, military actions against um, national based space assets and and with the growth of the mega constellations such as Elon Musk's uh, we're increasing that dependency on space and increasing our vulnerability to these kinds of uh, events so um, I think there's a really my my I don't know what I, my recommendation is that we need to to keep investment in terrestrial infrastructure that provides those services. Uh, because yes, uh, the consequences of losing access to satellite-based telecommunications are, are, for example, in Australia, within three days, supermarket shelves would be empty. Three days is all it takes to reduce a food transportation system that relies on GPS and other satellite data um, to bring it to a complete halt. So COVID would have nothing on this, uh, and yet, as in, and this isn't even a problem of space junk. This is simply a problem of space weather. So yeah, lots of work to be done, I guess, ar around this. So a complicated follow-up question to Rob Knight about microbiome-free mice. You said that they're less fecal and live longer. Is there any way to work out whether the long life is a direct result of no reproduction versus wear and tear? So in other words, does this have an implication of human longevity? Uh, well, they have longer lives relative to other lab mice that are similarly coddled in a uh, in, in a cage where they uh, don't have anything um, particularly much in the way of stimulation. So, uh, so the thinking is that the difference in longevity is um, is, is possibly uh, is, is possibly due to the lack of diversion of resources to microbial metabolism. Um, one, one thing that has not been done is systematic investigation of uh, metabolic and epigenetic markers that are, uh, that are associated with aging in conventional mice, which again would be a very interesting thing to do. One, one thing I should mention is that a lot of the tools for doing microbiome research 
have only existed uh, for a few years, especially um, especially with the ability to apply them at scale and uh, with adequate replication and sample size. So there are a whole lot of experiments like this that uh, you would absolutely want to see done, but in practice, they haven't been done yet because there's so many questions to answer. But the great thing about it is that there's a tremendous number of opportunities for grad students and postdocs wanting to enter the field and do exactly these kinds of studies. So, um, so no, the mechanism is not well understood. Um, one, one, one thing that we know it's not due to is better sleep because uh, germ-free mice uh, tend not to have a, a firm circadian rhythm established. It only gets established when they're colonized by microbes. So the one thing that it's not due to is that they're getting better sleep without being disturbed by all their, uh, all their children's microbial symbionts. But we don't really know what it is due to. Uh, but the leading, the leading hypothesis is, uh, is that it's something related to either the lack of diversion of uh, energy into the microbiome or the lack of immune stimulation, where the immune system is normally a uh, huge energy sink. I have now one last question. And um, this is uh, particularly for Asher Rossinger, but other people definitely on the panel should chime in. Uh, the Western U.S. has been under increasingly worse drought conditions, and in California, up to 80% of water use is for agricultural purposes, and it's mostly arid or desert location, which provide food and goods globally. The collapse of water availability in California will affect the rest of the world. Are we past the point where we can change water use practices such as moving to less water needy crops or shifting to desalinization of ocean water, which Israel has done, uh, what can we do to avoid steamrolling into a global catastrophe induced by reliance on Western agriculture in arid locations? I mean, I think that's, you know, an incredibly important question that touches on, you know, something that uh, Walter Willett was talking about, David Tillman, you know, with agriculture, there is a really strong link between water and food insecurity. Um, the nutrition community is increasingly recognizing the importance of water, not only in terms of, you know, what crops are better situated for different environments, but different ecosystems. I, I'm not an expert in agriculture and um, food distribution systems. So, you know, I might punt that question a little bit um, to to my you know, fellow panelists like Walter. Um, uh, but what I would say is that, you know, now is definitely the time to start thinking about which crops could potentially be moved to different locations, which ecosystems can support, uh, you know, changing climates and changing weather patterns as we have projections from the IPCC of which areas are gonna become wetter, which are gonna become drier. Um, how are we gonna transport water? How are we going to reuse water for agriculture to support those types of crops? But I, I might punt the, the, you know, a little bit of that question to, to Walter here. Yeah, I think we could ask about almonds in California and rice in California, couldn't we? Walter, can you speak to this? Sure. Uh, and, and that was, a, I think, a very good answer that is very uh, multifaceted that it's partly a question of uh, better and more efficient use of water for the crops that we are going to produce there, but also uh, shifting the balance of crops and then uh, also moving production of the same crop to another place. And there's no simple solution, but some combination of those uh, issues, those approaches will need to be done. In terms of almonds, that they've been sort of the bad poster child, I guess you might say, but it is more complicated. And talking to my colleagues uh, in uh, California uh, almond production uh, and uh, agriculture more broadly, apparently the flooding, the traditional flooding uh, is not totally wasted because that does go into the ground and, and recharge the aquifer there. Uh, and we did uh, some calculations a few years ago, and David Tillman may uh, have some uh, better calculations, but uh, a lot of the, a good bit of the land in the Central Valley is used to produce alfalfa, which is fed to cattle for milk production. That's probably much worse than almond production uh, because the, the 
moisture in alfalfa uh, production is evaporated and doesn't recharge the aquifer. And uh, there's inefficient uh, uh, use of energy inputs to produce milk. Uh, so it's uh, almonds uh, need to be looked at carefully, but they're not necessarily the worst factor there. And it, uh, probably uh, from a nutritional standpoint, an ecological standpoint, probably better to be having soy milk if you really want to drink uh, some uh, white liquid uh, uh, that can uh, have the same content of vitamin A, vitamin D, uh, calcium uh, by fortification. So uh, there's lots of different approaches here. But in general, a shift again toward more plant forward, not necessarily totally vegan diets will uh, be one of the most important ways of, of dealing with this. Maybe David if has other, just, other thoughts. Yeah, Walter, I'd love to jump in on this. Uh, you, what you said is, is totally correct. And I, and I think it's important to sort of look at the amounts of different things that people eat. Um, per kilogram of nuts, there's a pretty big water demand, but a typical serving size of almonds is, is like one ounce a day, 28 grams a day. And that's the amount that your nice uh, work has shown is uh, leads to a huge health benefit. Uh, one ounce of, of nuts a day has a, has a massive health benefit and one of the largest benefits attributable to any given food. And so, uh, and that the water impact, the water needed to do produce that is much less than the water needed to produce a serving of beef, for instance. So it's almonds aren't as good, let's say as corn or wheat or rice in terms of, of, of per serving but they're much better than almost any kind of meat that is eaten and they have lots of health benefits. So I think it's a, it's a, 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 um, a wise compromise uh, to do that. And the other issue is um, if you look at the actual amount of water used to produce different crops and, and come up with a water footprint of each of these crops per serving, uh, there's almost no crops that are different from each other because people who live in dry areas have to irrigate crops to produce their own food. And so because of that, uh, uh, almost any crop is, is grown in areas with, which have inadequate water, but they use irrigation. Uh, uh, Egypt has very high wheat yields, and it's all irrigated wheat, of course, which it has been for thousands of years in Egypt. And so it's um, the water issue isn't as clear to me as an ecologist as, as I think as I thought it was before I studied it. Uh, I think the main thing is to look at at the water impact per serving of a food. And serving sizes differ in what people tend to eat. And, and I think if we do that, even almonds are actually not that bad. Um, can I maybe put a little bit of a space spin on the question of water? So one of the reasons that there are so many plans to go back to the moon um, at the moment and uh, also plans to mine the moon is that water ice is, is one of the major targets at the lunar south pole. And the plan is that this will be used to make rocket fuel go onto Mars. Uh, and used to sustain lunar habitation. Um, at the same time, the outer space treaties make clear that the benefits of exploiting outer space resources have to be shared with all humanity. Something that uh, hasn't been discussed is whether uh, lunar water could in fact be um, exported back to Earth to relieve uh, possible water shortages. Uh, but one thing that is being discussed is that what's required to set up sustainable uh, biospheres uh, on another planet or moon where you don't have any of those things naturally occurring will produce technologies that will enable an, enable an incredibly efficient use of things like water and that this will be a benefit that could be shared with humanity according to the terms of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 and the Moon Agreement of 1979. So this is all aspirational uh, at the moment. We don't actually have those technologies, but um, uh, it might be worth thinking beyond the earth and incorporating some of the water sources and resources that we have in space um, that are the next target for human engagement with space. I think that for me, it becomes incredibly uh, difficult to grasp the idea to think that we can help Earth by getting resources from out of the planet and that we can establish uh, biospheres uh, in other planets. That's completely uh, unreal. And I think it's misleading in the sense that if we think like that, we are allowing us to think that we can continue, I mean, that the destruction that we're causing here, uh, somehow we could survive somewhere else. And 
Uh, to be honest, I think that it's incredibly dangerous to think like that. I mean, the problem that we're facing, and basically in my talk, I talk about extinction, but it's incredibly clear that what the other speakers has mentioned are extremely relevant to the extinction problem and to the uh, survival of humanity on this planet. And when we're talking about the existential threat, we don't have, I mean, when we talk about the, the year 2000, and, uh, I mean, 2100, that is long-term. That's, I mean, really what is going to happen in the next 20, 25 years is what, we'll, what we is going to define what is left in, the, in this planet and uh, if we collapse or not. So uh, my only caution on that, caution, is that we really need to be clear that what is going on now is going so fast that we don't have the luxury to think more than 50, 30, 50, 40 years. That's, that's a, caution, a word of caution that I like to, to, to put into the table. Gerardo, I'd, I'd like to agree with you on that. I think I've had many undergraduate students who, who say that uh, we don't need to worry about uh, pollution on Earth and climate change. We'll just go live on another planet. Well, that is pie in the sky. It is, it is totally ludicrous. Attempts to make biospheres on Earth have failed one after another. Uh, it's, there are very many massive technical reasons. I mean, it, 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 the, if I, I once calculated the mortgage payment you have to have to live in Biosphere 2 when it was going. It was about $80,000 per member per year, per month, not per year. It's if I can interrupt, um, this is a whole new symposium you're describing. <laughs> and I hope that we could get Alice back to be able to be part of this. I agree with you. I'm sure she does. I won't speak for Alice, but. No, no I agree. I agree. I, I, we yes. haven't got the technology to do this, but maybe we should be thinking about water in a much broader context than just yeah. the earth. So, yeah, but no, I agree. I agree with both those comments. I'm not a proponent for this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I think this tells us that we have a lot of work ahead of us. There's one question just generally think about is, what have humans done to the planet that has been beneficial to any, anybody but humans? Beneficial to the planet compared to, and not just to humans. Well, there are um, examples of anthropogenic soils that are actually um, apparently particularly fertile and do support fairly um, diverse ecosystems where they occur. The, the example everybody always kind of goes to is these Amazonian dark earths, although there's some controversy about when they developed and how they developed and to what extent they were anthropogenic and perhaps were they anthropogenic uh, via cultivation or was it actually sort of a pre-cultivation uh, process. So there are things that humans have done that have altered the ecosystem in ways that are not necessarily negative, but, uh, but certainly have had an impact. And there are lots of arguments too that uh, one could go to about the differential impact of humans on things like uh, megafauna extinctions, which is always a big fun topic that people argue about a lot. But um, all of these things have these kind of follow on consequences, which is it's kind of hard to ascribe a positive or a negative to it with great, um, you know, clarity, uh, if you don't know exactly how all of these ecosystems actually interacted in the past. And so it's kind of like putting a qualitative um, assessment on, on something that is simply a change. But I think in the last few hundred years, we've been able to carefully document and witness changes that I would not hesitate to say have been extremely negative with respect to other organisms. So however we want to define something that is a negative impact, the loss of biodiversity has been very real. And um, I just think that if we kind of go back in time, we find that there have been things that humans have done to actually promote biodiversity through their actions that are just not very well documented because most of the emphasis has been on these really big obvious transformations instead. So. Um, positive, negative, um, I think I can be pretty clear that we've had negative impact recently, but I would, I would wonder if it has always been that way. I like that. Thank you. And on a positive note. Yes. Well, I'd like <laughs> to just like say it. that I agree with Jessica that, um, you know, that the, to the extent that humans have altered the landscape, um, that's had many negative uh, consequences on biodiversity. But if you were a, an, an opossum um, or a coyote 
or a raccoon, you would have to say that the human alteration of the environment has benefited your species. Uh, I really hope we have, I have thoroughly enjoyed this symposium and I truly thank the um, discussants. I thank the speakers. Um, I, the expertise, your willingness to probe human impact upon this planet and beyond has really been um, thoroughly fascinating. Um, you've given us much to think about as well as much to act upon. Also on behalf of the CARTA's leadership, including my co-chair, Ajit Varki, we'd like to once again thank this symposium's generous supporters, many of whom are listed here, and as well as the collaborative efforts of the CARTA staff, uh, colleagues from the Supercomputer Center, San Diego Supercomputer Center, and UCSD TV. And finally, I'd like to thank the audience, your curiosity, your commitment over the last several hours. As we've heard and seen today, and I'll have to say this as a positive, humans are capable of amazing feats. And if anything can be done to mitigate the environmental harms humans have caused, it is up to us as human species and up to you. As our speakers have said, we must become actors instead of just spectators. We must prepare, this is my, my co-chair, we must prepare for the worst and we cannot be optimistic about the best. And then I would say ecosystem management as has been wrapped up in the last um, comment. Ecosystem management, if we could move to functional ecosystems, we must become good environmental managers, not destroyers and not ecosystem destroyers. So we look forward to you joining us in future CARTA symposia. You can look, check the CARTA website, Twitter, Facebook for updates, uh, go well, and we hope to see you in the future until we meet again. Thank you very much, bye-bye.